Have you ever wondered why life is so full of contradictions? It is full of beauty and wonder, yet at the same time contains much that is ugly. Why is it that almost everything good in life is fleeting and never really satisfies? Why is it that our closest and most intimate relationships can cause us so much pain? How can it be that a world which is able to produce writers, artists, composers, can also produce murderers, tyrants and abusers? How can good and evil exist together? And above all, why is it that all of us die at the end? Was it always meant to be like this? In part two of the What is Christianity course, we're going to go back to the beginning to see how God made the world and how he intended it to be. The book, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe by Douglas Adams, has one of my favourite quotes in about the beginning of the world. In the beginning, the universe was created. This made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. I like the quote because it humorously sums up the tension between the good and evil in the universe. You may know that it borrows from the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, but it leaves out something significant. Let me read the verse and see if you can spot the difference. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Did you notice it? Crucially, Adams left out God. He said that the universe was created, not that God created the universe. He mentions the creation, but not the creator. This is not a mere oversight. Western civilization today consistently leaves God out of the equation. For example, the Charter of the United Nations, originally written in 1945, says nothing about God. Similarly, despite the centuries-long Christian heritage of Europe, God does not feature in the Constitution of the European Union. And how many people on TV lately have you heard talking about their faith in God? Maybe this is because the universe having a creator is an inconvenient truth to the secular authorities. It often stands in the way of their agenda. This is why it's so important to see what the Bible says. This first verse in Genesis contains some of the most basic and important truths in Christianity. There are three things that I want to highlight today. Firstly, there was a beginning. Scientists talk about the Big Bang and how everything in the universe originated from one giant explosion. It's strange how scientists have come to the same conclusion as the Bible that there was a beginning to the universe. In the early part of the 20th century, scientists favoured a steady state model, where the universe has no beginning or end, just exists. But by the mid 20th century, most scientists believe that the evidence overwhelmingly pointed to the universe having a beginning. Of course, Science can't answer the question of what came before the Big Bang. Terry Pratchett once wittily observed, in the beginning was nothing, which exploded. Maybe it's just me, but 
I don't think the idea of nothing exploding is very scientific. Science has no answers for why there should be something rather than nothing. The universe has to start with something, and I believe the Genesis explanation is the best and most logical, that it was God. Secondly, the universe was created. The universe did not simply happen by random chance. Everything that we see in the universe, from the vastness of space to the complexity of a tiny insect, was planned. That's not how a lot of scientists describe it today. Compare Genesis, for example, with the words of the well-known atheist Richard Dawkins. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And he said elsewhere in the book, DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is. And we dance to its music. Dawkins sees no meaning or purpose in the universe. Everything is simply a product of blind scientific processes. We dance to the music of our DNA. That's all. Does that sound like an attractive universe to you? A universe that you want to live in? By contrast, Genesis says that God created the world. Whatever processes he used to make it in terms of science, there is a will and a purpose behind it. We are more than simply space dust. Thirdly, the universe was created by one God. Some religions believe that there are multiple gods. The ancient Greeks and Romans had many gods. But the Bible teaches that there is one God, which, if you think about it, is the only thing that makes sense. If there was more than one God, then none of them would really be God. As I said a moment ago, these truths are fundamental to Christianity, and this has implications for the way that we live. One implication is that not all religions are correct. You can't choose to believe in Christianity and believe in Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism and just pick and mix whichever you want of any of those. There's only one God. We can't just choose different bits of religion to suit us. Another implication is because God made the world, we can't understand it without knowing him. Trying to understand the world without God is like trying to put Ikea furniture together without the instructions. You might be able to guess where some of the pieces go, but you're probably not going to get it completely right. After all, some people have no chance with the instructions, let alone without them. If we try to understand the world without God, we won't get it right. And in fact, will almost certainly get it very wrong. The final implication is that because God made us, we belong to him and therefore we should obey him. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Because God made the universe, it belongs to God, and so does everyone who lives in it, including you and me. God has the rights as the one who created us to give us our purpose in life and to show us how to live. Fortunately, that's good news, and that's what we're going to move on to now. It's impossible to overstate just how incredible and amazing 
the world is. The world is full of beauty and wonder. Sunsets, oceans, mountains, flowers. You could go on and on. Animals too are amazing. The earth has a rich and complex ecosystem full of insects and animals, sea creatures and flying birds. It's not surprising to us that the world should be like this when we look at what the Bible has to say about creation. You can read it for yourself in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We don't have time to go through the whole thing together, but let me quote you a little bit to give you an idea. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. As we saw in the previous section, God made the world out of nothing. He simply speaks, and it happens. God doesn't create like us. We need to take something that's there already and make it into something else. We need the raw materials. God, on the other hand, can create from nothing. There was nothing, then God spoke, then it was there. This is a demonstration of how powerful God's word is, something we touched on last week when we looked at the Bible. God's words are more than human words. They come with the power to create and shape the universe. There's one word which dominates this section of Genesis, and it is the word good. We saw it twice in the verses we read, but in total it's used seven times in this one chapter. Genesis repeats over and over again that creation is good. God is good, and he made a good world. He made the world good because he is good. Creation demonstrates who God is. It's a bit like art. The artwork that someone creates shows something about who they are. It tells you about what they value, what they think is beautiful. It shows you their perspective. It's a bit like that with the world. God created the universe as a reflection of who he is. One important implication of this is that being a Christian is not about being super spiritual and trying to get away from the world. Sometimes people think that being a Christian is about trying to avoid earthly things as much as possible. For example, some people think that to be a Christian, you need to become a monk or a nun and live away from everyone. People have believed this throughout history. One particularly extreme example was St. Simeon Stylites, who spent 37 years living on a pillar in the desert near Aleppo in uh, modern day Syria. His disciples used to bring him food. He believed that the Christian life was all about trying to get closer to God by separating yourself from all the temptations in the world. Although his devotion to God was admirable, I believe he was misguided. Being a Christian doesn't mean getting away from everything in the world. It means using and enjoying these things as God intended. God made the world and he made it for us to enjoy. God didn't need to make colour. He could have made everything shades of grey. God didn't need to make mountains and valleys. He could have made the world completely flat. God didn't need to make all kinds of fruit and vegetables. 
he could have just given us one kind of food to eat. God did all these things intentionally. This is the world that he wanted to create in all of its diversity and variety and beauty. God made the world gloriously good because he is good. His goodness and greatness is shown throughout the whole of creation. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. If you want to know how glorious and good God is, just look at the beauty and wonder of the universe. It reveals to us God's majesty and splendour. We're going to finish off this session by focusing on human beings to think about what it is that makes us unique. The most amazing animal of all is the human being. We are not simply driven by instinct, but we are conscious, rational beings capable of great works of art, architecture, scientific advances, technology, music. Shakespeare put it best when he said, What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculties! In form and moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! The beauty of the world the paragon of animals. The world as a whole is incredible, but we recognise even amongst the beauty of the universe, there is something unique and supreme about human beings. There is something which distinguishes us human beings from the other animals. The comedian Chris Addison once joked, once they have established a home or a nest, very few other animals put an eight-foot-high inflatable Santa outside their front door. It's funny, but it's true, isn't it? There is something which distinguishes human beings from the animal kingdom. Let's go back to the part of Genesis chapter 1 which talks about the creation of human beings. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. These verses show that there is something different about human beings compared to all the other animals. Human beings alone are said to be made in God's image. What that means is that people are made to be like God in a way that other animals aren't. Human beings were made to rule over and subdue the earth. Think about that for a second. God, the king of the whole universe, made human beings and delegated some of his authority to us to rule and look after the world. That's what we are here for. We are God's vice regents. We are his ambassadors. We are here to rule on his behalf. When we act in ways that are good and creative, we are doing God's will. For example, when we cultivate a garden, when we grow fruit and vegetables, when we look after animals, when we build something beautiful, we are in a sense doing God's will. Everything good that humanity produces, technology, architecture, landscaping, and so on, all derives from God's original instruction to human beings. 
God wants human beings to flourish. One of my favourite quotes about this is from Irenaeus, who was a bishop in the early church. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. Some people think that God just wants to stifle us, to hold us back. But that's the exact opposite of the truth. The truth is it's only when we come to know God that we become fully alive. God doesn't want to hold us back, but for us to flourish as his image bearers. There is a deeper implication of being made in the image of God. Both you and I and everyone we meet are made in the image of God. That means how we treat other people really matters. No one captured this better than C.S. Lewis in his sermon, The Weight of Glory. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them, that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Extraordinary words. Being made in the image of God has implications for us, for how we live, for how we relate to God, and for how we relate to others. Did you notice that God said, let us make mankind in our image. This hints at the fact that God is not solitary, a solitary, lonely individual. God is, and has always been, three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This means that God is, and has always been, a community of other person-centred love. This is how God made us to be. He didn't make us human beings to be isolated individuals. He made us to be a community. This is why relationships are the most fundamental things about us that define us as human beings. Think about it. Before a child is even born, it has a mother and father, grandparents, maybe brothers and sisters, cousins, aunts and uncles. A child is born into a network of relationships. We are defined not simply by ourselves on our own, but in connection with others. One of John Donne's most famous poems is No Man is an Island. No man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. No human being is an island, Every human being is part of the human race. This is how God designed us. That's why relationships are so fundamental to who we are and why they can be the source of our greatest joys as well as our deepest pain. You're probably thinking, all oh, this sounds great, but you haven't answered the question you started with. If this world is as good as as you make it sound, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? To answer that question, we'll need to move on to Genesis chapter 3, but we don't have time to do that now, so you'll have to come back next week. Let's take a moment, as we always do in this course, to finish with a prayer and ask for God to help us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for making a good world. We thank you that 
you made this good world for us to enjoy. And we thank you for creating it so beautiful and wonderful. And thank you for making us in your image. And we pray that you would help us to discover what it means to be made in your image. And especially, Lord, in how we can treat other people to respect them as your image bearers, as we respect ourselves. So we ask for these things, trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining me for this session of the What is Christianity course. If you missed it last week, do go back and have a look at the first part of the course, which was all about the Bible. And there's, this course will be happening week by week on the Understand the Bible channel. Do have a look. And it's all on the playlist and it's all on the website. So look at all of those things. And if you'd like to get a once a week email with any new content, you can sign up for that on the Understand the Bible website. God bless and I'll see you again soon.